We welcome those who join the service via Facebook or YouTube. We have several who are out on vacation, and we miss you when you're not here. But we're glad you have the opportunity to join with us. But those of you who are here just because you've chosen not to be here, we want to remind you that we would love to have you here with us as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. Lord God, we wait this morning to hear your word delivered to us, Father God. You've already spoken to us this morning, Lord God, during our time of prayer and our time of song and our time of fellowship. Now, Lord God, we ask that you speak to us directly from your word this day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, we've been on the several weeks now, so I guess several months almost at this point, looking at um, prophecy, current events, and the end times. I was reading this week in several opportunities, paying up several stories, talking about anti-Semitism that's going rampant across the nation and around the world. So many people are turning against the Jews. We see it sweeping across college campuses. And so many were signing so many different things in their protest against Israel until all of a sudden everyone began to make all their names apparent and open and visible. And then they suddenly realized that these schools that they were attending were pretty much subsidized by large portions of the Jewish population. And they began to want to change their mind and take their names off these lists. Anytime we see a rise in the country against those, those of the Jewish faith and around the world, we always see that it precedes imminent evil. We saw that during World War II. We see that whenever they begin to go against our nations or governments, begin to go against the chosen people of God, the one that he chose, the Israelites, the Jews, that we see things begin to happen and we see, that see such evil run rampant. And we're seeing that now as a setting of the stage for the Antichrist to be able to come in. Because he will come in and say that he has found a peace between the Jews and everyone else in the world. He'll say, peace, peace, peace. But yet at one point he will step into the the rebuilt tabernacle and he will proclaim himself as the Messiah. And immediately the Jewish faith will know that they have fallen aside and not followed the true Christ. I want you to be in prayer for all of these things that are going on for their protection. We've reached our point in our study of prophecy, current event, and times. I believe we see our blessed hope, and we begin to speak today of the rapture. The word rapture actually does not appear in the Bible itself. You'll also learn that the word rapture does not often appear in church pulpits anymore either. It's not spoken of. It's not something that's even really recognize their entire denominations that speak nothing of the rapture. They've totally and completely set it aside, which to us is a blessed hope, and then we hold to that. When I was a youth pastor 25 years ago, and I just began, I was talking to the kids, and I wanted to know, well, okay, what I was going on. I said, look, I said, next week we're going to talk about the rapture, and I'm going to, I said, I'm going to show you all a little movie about the rapture. Well, one of them got real excited because... He thought that I was talking about raptors and that we were going to watch Jurassic Park. And he was so excited that we were going to talk about the raptors. And he even began to go the whole week. He'd say, oh, what are we talking about next? He said, the raptors, ah, and he'd make the little growling noise. It was just the oddest thing that he had it just in his mind. That's what we were going to be talking about. And I've got to say honestly that many people in the church have no more comprehension of the rapture than that 13-year-old boy did. (laughs) Just because they've not been taught. They They do not know. It's not spoken of anymore. It's not taught in the churches anymore. I want us to return to our outline for discussing the prophecy and current event and the end times. And remember what our outline was? Our our outline's Matthew chapter 24. I've been asking you to read through that every week when you get an opportunity. So let's go into Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to go to verse 30 today. Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. A reminder, this is Jesus Christ. He was preaching on the Mount of Olives. This is Jesus' sermon. He's telling them these things. Jesus said, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. 
Now, that corresponds where we are in our reading of Revelation. We are on the sixth seal in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 6. Let's we'll go there now, starting with verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 through 14. When he opened the sixth seal, again, we're in heaven. This is John being revealed this, and we have Christ there opening the seal. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter's fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The sign of the rapture, everyone wants to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. The sign of the rapture is going to take place in the skies. You'll see it in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And Jesus told us of these things also in Luke chapter 21. Nothing has been hidden from us. Our word is revealed. His word is revealed to us. In Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Is near. When you see what things? He said, when you see these things happening, stand up. Your salvation is right there. What things? Well, let's go back a little bit. Luke 21, we'll go back to the 25th first. He said, there will be strange signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil. Does that sound familiar? Perplexed by the roaring seas and the strange tides. Does that sound familiar? People will be terrified of what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heaven will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things that begin to happen, stand up and look for your salvation is near. Your salvation is near. He says that point in time when you begin to see these things to come together, rejoice because your salvation is here. Now my question now is to use salvation from what? Salvation from what? Now, not our salvation from sin because we experience that when we accept Christ Jesus. So our salvation from what? I believe it's our salvation from the wrath of Satan, our salvation from the wrath of man, all these things that we have happening and we see around us, all these things that we saw in the opening of the five prior seals. If you weren't here, find them on YouTube. They're there. We went through all of the seals as they were open. I believe he wants to save us from those things. He said said before, if I do not hasten my return, none will survive. He told us that. We see that salvation in a God-sized way. We go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns, I believe that is us, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still around, and alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. Now, pay attention. Caught up. Whenever the New Testament was transferred into Latin, that's where you get the word rapturo, which is the closest thing we have to the word rapture. It means to be caught up. We will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful of the things to come. And said, he says what? Encourage yourself. These words should lift you up that Christ is soon coming. Christ is soon coming. We preach the gospel, the good news, and the gospel is what? Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ lived, Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and Jesus Christ is coming. That is the gospel. That is the good news. Rejoice. We've waited our entire lives, those of us who have been in Christ, for him to return. And he is soon coming. And it's just as exciting as it sounds. It will play out bigger than any movie you could ever imagine, any sci-fi flick or however they think they could ever interpret it. Any video you could ever see, it's much bigger than any of that. We shall go up to meet him in the air, we are told. We used to sing the old song, the old camp meeting song, what there's going to be a meeting in the air. In the sweet, sweet by and by. And it's true. It is coming. That is a hope that we hold to. We hold to that hope because God is faithful. Not because we are faithful. If we depend on our faithfulness, there's not much hope in that. 
Our hope is in God's faithfulness, the fact that God does not fail us. When we read of the signs of the times, and we see the signs of the times in the Word, we see the sign of the times in the newspaper. Whenever you turn on the TV, you may get some distorted views, but you're still seeing the fact that the world is coming to an end. The signs in the sky, we see the falling of stars, and that's time with the ascension of the saints. We and the other saints, the other saints are returning at the same time when we're going up. Last night we had a huge meteor shower. We didn't get to see it because it was so cloudy. I get a little update to my phone. It's just something I like. And it'll alert me. It says, hey, the space station's passing by in three minutes. I'm like, all right, let me go get up and look. Now I'm saying, but clouds. Thank you, God, for the clouds. Thank you for the rain. But it alerted me, hey, the space station's coming over. And it alerted me a little later, hey, it's got a meteor shower happening over here. I'm like, well, that's nice. It's wonderful. Somebody gets to see it, but I'm thankful for the rain. The signs of his times will come in the skies. Whenever Christ came the first time at his birth, the wise men came and they followed what? A star. It's not so far-fetched to think that he will once again use the heavens for the entire world to see what is taking place. The entire world to see what is happening. Our ascent and their descent, those who are dead in Christ, the fact that whenever they return, whenever they rise first and then they return and we go up, it's just there's a lot of things going to be going on in a short period of time. And all that aligns with what John sees in Revelation chapter 7. There's a lot of scripture this morning, but I think we need it. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. John is in Revelation chapter 7. This is right after the rapture, and he reads this. He said, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And that's us. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now this happens right before the, the signs in the heavens and right, right after the signs in the heavens, but right before the seventh seal. It's the saints that made it through the first half of the tribulation. Through all the trials, they endured the wrath of Satan. Everything that Satan could throw at them, everything that the world could come up with, they were able to endure. That is us. I believe that is us. I believe we are coming into that, to that time. We go on to read Revelation chapter 7, verse 15. And it starts up here. It says, Therefore they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He's telling John, he said, they've been called up. They're in their white robes. They are here. He said, no longer are they hungry. No longer are they thirsty. No more tears are in their eyes. Which means that what? They were hungry. They were thirsty. They had been scorched, it said. And yet they had shed many tears. He said, no more. They had passed through that time of tribulation, though. They had had everything thrown at them. Everything that the world could throw at them. Yet they were able to overcome that hunger, lack of water, those things. They made it through. Now, did they all make it through alive? I don't know. But I see them all at the throne with God himself. So I do know that there's answers to prayers in different ways. My mom was so sick last year at this time. We, I thought about something that time. Marcy said, we didn't even, I don't even remember us doing that last year. Something we did every year at Christmas. And she said, well, your mom was so sick. I said, well, it's just so different. And I prayed that my mom would be healed. And you know what? My mom is healed. She is with Christ Jesus today. She was healed Not in the way that I asked for it, but yet she was healed. We see those in white around the throne, those who came through and overcame. Some overcome as to death, we are told. Some died in the times that are to come. Some came through. But we all know this, that they have received the exact same reward. We know that God has given them a promise. All these things that are given to us happen if we endure. If we endure. Don't forget that. If we endure. 
Back to Matthew chapter 24 real quick. Matthew 24, 13 says, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Church, we've got to endure. God did not bring us this far just to bring us this far, we've said before. We come through, but we must endure. We have got to make it to the end. It's not good enough to ride, what, 68 miles last week or week before? What, you got to ride, what, 69 miles? You know, I can't run a marathon because it's 26.1 miles, I think. Is that right? 26.2 miles. I can't run it because of that point two at the end. I would just stop at 26. And what? I wouldn't get my medal. I wouldn't get my awards. We have got to endure to the end. Philippians 4.13. I think this is a much better translation of Philippians 4.13. And many of us know that scripture. But this translation says, I can endure all things through the power of the one who gives me strength. Many translations say, I can do all things. But the original says, I can endure all things. Can you endure all things? Yes, you can. I have successfully married off both of my daughters. So yes, I was able to endure 20 plus years of raising girls. I can endure all things. And the promise at the end was well worth it. All of these events lead up to the seventh and final seal. And we're going to close out today where we were on our, on our seals. So we're going to go to the seventh seal in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel come and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. There is an earth. There is in heaven, I'm sorry, for half an hour, which represents in prophetic time about a week, silence. And this is foretold in prophecy as well. We've read of that. Actually, if we go back to Zephaniah and Habakkuk, we told you we were going to do prophecy as well. If we go back to those, we see the fact that in Habakkuk and Zephaniah, it is told that there will be silence. Before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near, Zephaniah 1 7. It says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him, says Habakkuk 2 and 20. This is the time that you see if you're ever in a courtroom. Many of you have been in a courtroom. I hope it was for jury duty and not, it depends on which side of the bench you're on. But in a courtroom, whenever there's a time, whenever the judge is ready to give their finding, give their ruling, there is what? There's silence in the court. And I'll tell you that. I'm about to give my ruling, but there will be silence. And there's a time. He takes, he opens it up, and he reads what the jury has given to him. He folds it back up, and there's no, there's no cont- eye contact. There's nothing in his reaction to let you know what he just read. And there's a time of silence as you wait. And I believe that at this point, whenever we are welcomed into heaven, when we come into there in our white robes and we're standing there and that seventh seal is opened in front of us, there's a time of silence as they wait to hear what the Lord has to say. He's about to give his verdict. Then the judgment is given. In the final seventh seal, that precedes the seven trumpets of God's wrath, which I believe is not for us, church. We will not go through the wrath of God. It sees what we just read in Revelation that it pours out the fire from the thrones, thunder, rumbling, flashes of light, and we read of actual literal fire falling from heaven. The fire and brimstone, we've all talked about the preachers, the old preachers that preach that into you. You've got to not, you've got to accept Christ. If not, you're going to experience fire and brimstone. This is it. When it literally rains from the sky, fire and brimstone. The same as the punishments we see on Sodom and Gomorrah. We see those again. We have endured the wrath of Satan and the wrath of man, but we are saved from the wrath of God. And we are done so by the rapture. We are raptured. It becomes a verb. When discussing the rapture, it's vital to remember a few things. Whenever we talk about it, somebody asks you, hey, what did you talk about in church? Well, we talked about the rapture. Like, oh, they're going to get all these kind of things. They said, no, 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 it's very simple. 
Here is the way the rapture works. We should worry less about when Christ is coming and more about if we are going. Period. We should worry less about when Christ is coming and worry more about if we are going. And I have in there, I can choose my pronouns. I choose the pronoun we. We are going. Not just me, my four, and no more. If we are going. We sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We should be worried about all of those around us, those in our care, our friends, our family, our coworkers. Because the second thing you need to remember is that if the only person you've made an effort to get to heaven is you, then you probably won't make it. And my reasoning behind that is because you were not obedient to what Christ told us to do. If you haven't been bold enough to share the gospel with someone else now, in this time of relative peace, I've told you, you can go to the courthouse square, you can go anywhere you want, anywhere in this town, and you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone at any time. You're free to do that. There are even allowances within the schools for teachers to do those things. There are certain ways, whether it's student-led or whatever. There are not this great amount of restrictions upon us that we sometimes hide behind. We are free to proclaim the gospel. We have Facebook. We have telephones. We have all of these ways. If you're not going to do it now in this time of peace, how can you be strong enough to be able to withstand when the tribulation comes? When they come to you and say, do you truly believe in Christ Jesus? Do you stand upon the preachings of this book, they will ask you. And how can you say yes when you don't live the things of this book? We're beginning in the next weeks to come to make a push to be able to evangelize, which is a fancy word to give the good gospel, the good news, the gospel to the community. We're going to start that push really hard in the next month or so. To be able to put into, we've asked before, say, well, what, what does this church do? What can we give the community? And there's different resources, there are different things in the community. But what the church needs to, I think, be known for right now is the fact that we are the source to be able to give out hope. And what we're going through is what's called the Hope Initiative. It's a program. There's a, a book involved with it. And if y'all want one, I need to see about getting you something. They're about 10 bucks. That's, that's the cost. So you can order them on Amazon. It's probably pray and go. And it's an opportunity for us to become a great commission church. To be a church that goes out and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just in our words, but in our deeds. And we become known as a praying church. So when, what does the community need? They need someone to pray for them. People that contact me all the time say, I just need you to pray for me. We need to be known for that. And that power comes in the strength of the Holy Spirit. We need to be open. And we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. To be open to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Open to what the Holy Spirit has for us. The Holy Spirit will tell us what to say. Y'all don't know what to say. If you've read the Word, if you've been in the, in the Gospel, in the good book, then He will recall to you those things that you have heard, that you have read. We grow in doing, church. How do we grow? What do we need to do? We grow in doing. We need to be doing something. We need to exercise our muscles. Let's do that now. I want you to stand. That's an easy enough muscle. I want you to stand right now. I want us to be able to proclaim a few things. I want us to be able to know that we're following what Jesus has done, told us to do. When I went into the National Guard, I raised my hand and I swore an oath and I was lucky enough to participate in the Veterans Day event Friday over here. Chris and others who have served, we rose our hand and we, we took an oath and we said, this is what we are going to do. We said the words out loud. I think it's important for us, church, to know that we've been given a command. And I want you to read this with me this morning. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you agree with me, a simple amen will suffice. Amen. Father God, we stand up here today asking all that we are being commissioned, as it were, officers into your army. Lord God, we accept that today, that commission, the great commission. 
you've told us to go forward and preach the gospel unto all nations. And we, Father God, we agree to do that this morning. Lord God, give us strength. Give us the Holy Spirit. Give us, Lord God, the desire to be able to go forth and do what you have told us to do. Father God, let us be quick to follow the orders that you've given us, the commandments that you've given us. Lord God, let us be as to the world light. Let us bring into them, Lord God, a light and a hope that will outshine the darkness and fear that they see around them now. I pray, Father God, a blessing upon all those that are gathered here in your name today. In Jesus' blessed name we all say, Amen. Y'all have a blessed and wonderful week.